John and Kate plus eight. Welcome to Sound the Door. His name's Kenneth Muirator. I wanted to take this video segment to address their big announcement. Now, I'm not a big TV watcher of late, and I hadn't really, you know, watched their show. I just was scanning the internet for some other items, and I came across this particular article. And being as this article had to do with family, it's kind of close to home to me. I went ahead and read it, and then I saw the video clip, so I listened to him. And when I listened to the clips, I heard him say, you know, they, they plan on separating because, and this is paraphrasing, they're unable to, you know, communicate without arguing, and it's not fair to the children. So it would be best for the, for the children's sake if they separated. And, of course, I did read, of course, there might have been some incidents of infidelity within the marriage as well. You know, and... and I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking on myself, you know, to the question that's resonating in my mind, I mean, aside from infidelity, I think if there's infidelity that there's forgiveness in Jesus, you know, we have to understand that God's justice system has paid for the sins of man. You know, it was the broken body of our Lord that covered the offenses we received. If you think about it, if somebody's been unfaithful to you, if they've cheated on you, if they've committed adultery, in the marriage bed. God doesn't overlook it. He's not condoning it. He says, my son's broken body is given for you. Okay. If we've sinned, if we are the ones that committed the adultery, if we've committed the offense against the marriage bed, the Lord's not saying, uh, you know, listen, uh, we're just going to forget about it. Okay. He's not saying it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It's an atrocity. There's consequences that are going to have to be paid. But he's also saying, this is my blood shed for you for the remission of your sins. See, that's God's justice system. And in the case of infidelity, God doesn't ask the spouse to stay in that. He doesn't put that on the spouse's shoulder that experienced that. He says, if you choose to depart, depart, you're free. Okay, because he's a merciful God, he's a compassionate God, and he doesn't put that additional burden on us in the spite of in spite of somebody else's sin and, and neglect of, of the sanctity of marriage. Doesn't mean there isn't forgiveness. They don't have to get divorced, but they can if they choose to. God doesn't hold it against them. He understands. But my question has to do with this arguing. That's my question. Why is there arguing? And I think this is a question we ought to be asking ourselves. I mean, it's best for the kids. Well, okay, it makes sense. So, yeah, great idea. Instead, we ought to be asking, what is our arguing for? I mean, let's not mock God. Let's not mock his kingship, his rule of law. You see, who of us that have been employed at one time? I mean, maybe even if you're self-employed, okay? When you work for a customer, well, that customer is like your boss. Well, imagine if you had an employer and you went into him every day and you argued with him. But God is a God of headship. He's a God of subjection and submission. If you did that with your boss, eventually your boss is going to fire you. They're going to be like, listen, I don't care what your program is. I'm the boss and we're running it this way. And if you don't like the way the ship is running, there's the door. Because you can't run a company like that. You can't run a company based on teamwork. Somebody has to be in charge. It's not a democracy. Same thing with churchianity. Maybe you participate in church. But listen, these open sepulchers that are heads of these corporations that we call church today, they're spewing out lies. I heard one the other day spewing out a lie over the airways. A false prophet, the false prophet, speaking lies and all hypocrisy. And he's saying, well, you know, and this has to go with God's order of operation. It's that we have to understand first. You know, that Jesus Christ submits to the Father. That man submits to Jesus Christ. The woman submits to the man. The children obey their parents. They submit to their parents. It's headship. It's subjection. The man submits to Christ. It's submission. The woman submits to man. But what are we submitting to? Like I was saying, I, I heard this open sepulcher, this false prophet, spewing lies. You know, a head of a corporation, you know, a church, you know, 501c3 corporation saying, well, you know, 
the reason that women don't submit to men is because men are weak leaders. If they're not doing a good job leading. Now, if they would be good leaders, maybe the women would follow. I mean, how do you expect a woman to submit to a man who's making poor decisions? He's a poor decision maker. No woman can submit to that. I wouldn't. Who, listen, if your man is making bad decisions, who can trust that man? Why should she submit to that? And he's just beating up men with his club, his false prophet. That's not what God's doing. God doesn't put those heavy loads on men. God says, men be the priests of your home and uphold the word. Uphold the word of God. Okay? And he's not putting this heavy load on women. He's not telling women to submit to imperfection. But that's what this guy, this false prophet, is teaching women. They don't need to submit because your man's imperfect. He's not a good leader. He hasn't earned your respect. And you don't need to submit to him until he earns your respect. Friends, that's a lie from the pits of hell. That's what these false prophets, these head of corporations teach. But that's not the word of God. God never expects you to submit to imperfection. He expects you to submit to the perfect word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ says, women, submit to your husbands in all things. Learn from them in all quietness and submissiveness. So with that in mind, I go back to the question that came into my mind when I saw this announcement from John and Kate. Why is there arguing? It takes two people to argue. What is she arguing about? Now, if there was a case of infidelity, that's fine. We talk about that. But let's just, I'm thinking of this in, in a general sense, in the general sense of marriage, okay? Aside from the all these great exceptions that oftentimes people want to bring up when you talk about subjection and submission. You know, you of course, the spouse that got beat and the preacher that told her to stay there because she was to be submissive. You know, they always want to bring up these cases. But if you would submit yourself to the Word of God, you would see that the woman's allowed to be separated from her husband. There's nothing wrong with being separated, but there is something wrong with being divorced. There is something wrong with saying it's best for our kids. No, what's best for the kids is that the husband be the priest of the home and submit himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. That the wife, okay, submit herself to the Lord Jesus Christ and be submissive to her husband. That's what's best. We're going to pay the consequences, and we do pay the consequences when we don't submit to the Word of God. We're all going to be raised bodily, incorruptible to face judgment. The question is, are you going to count yourself dead now in Christ? Are you going to see the Father pour out the wrath for your sin? Are you going to see Jesus' broken body for the sins of your spouse? Okay, are you going to see the shed blood of Christ for your own sin? Is that enough for you? Is that enough for you? Are you in the Spirit? Are you walking by the Spirit? I mean, when we think about it, we're mocking God. You know, we take these vows till death to, a, to us part, for better or for worse, for richer or for poor. But listen, if, if we're not getting our way, if the wife's not going to get her way, well, she's out of here. Do that in your work. Do that with your boss. You wouldn't dare do it to your boss. If you do, you'd be unemployed. Go to your boss and say, I don't like the way you're running things. And uh, if you don't consider my opinion and do it my way, I'm leaving, and I'm going to take half the company with me, and I'll leave you with the debt. Friends, that's ridiculous. Nobody would do that. But yet the devil, the enemy of our souls, the world and the flesh, has lied to us, telling us, well, that's the way we can run our households. We can run our households this way. We can have anarchy in our households. It's never going to work. Go to your, if you're in church, Yanny, if you belong to a corporation, ask your a corporate CEO if uh, next time you have a church service, a, a church service, go ask them if you can take over the pulpit and preach and say, say have the sermon for that day. See what they say. And then if he says no, begin to argue with them and tell them about all your reasonings for wanting to do that. You think he's going to let you get away with it? I don't think so. But yet, that's what they say. That's how they say you can run the household. God is not putting a heavy load on the shoulders of women. He's not asking women to submit to imperfection. Okay, maybe your husband is an idiot in some regards and has made some poor decisions. Maybe he's not a man of God. And maybe he hasn't submitted himself to the Word. But that's not what you're submitting to. If you don't have Christ, I urge you, I ask you to duly consider the matter. We need a Savior. God knows we do. 
If you want to do it on your own without him, he tells you to be perfect. But if you'll come to him, the perfect man, he'll come and abide in you and he'll give you peace and he'll bring you joy in the midst of the imperfection of this world. I hope you consider this and I hope that God gives you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you might know more and more. God bless.